The moment is here, you can stop your search. It's Comics by Perch. Hey everybody, this is Perch, and I answered other mail about pricing. Hey, these these comics are owned by big corporations, so why can't the pricing go down? And I mean, it. it look, I, I understand the logical sense, but also, you know, as a counter to that, money. People like money, and uh, co- corporations tend to not want to part with that. But here's a different kind of angle, uh, more from uh, probably a perspective many of you can relate to. It says, "Dear Perch Perchington, I was looking through the September DC solicits and saw the new Batman and Robin and Birds and Prey." are priced at $4.99 for a standard size comic. DC did this several months ago with the new Superman title, too. I'm sure they're just testing the waters to see if they can raise prices line-wide, but $5 for a standard size comic is more than I would willing to spend. I would really like to read these titles, but find myself drawing a line in the sand. By the way, I don't think it's testing the waters. I think the waters have been tested, and they're going to it. So they're just line-wide. Um, the, you know, we're, we're, everything is going to get there, you know, pretty quickly now, uh, for sure. But we'll go, we'll get in more to that. Uh, by the way, I, I should ask this. So I think this was Joe Casada, but it may have been Axel Alonso. It may have been Cebulski. I, I'm not sure, but I think it was Joe Casada. Um, and it, it, there was a statement made, and this is several years ago. This is like easily 10 years ago, maybe more. Where the comment was, you know, comic books are a good value for your money. I, I'm I'm paraphrasing, uh, because you're getting kind of unique art, and you're you're getting an artist to produce something, and it's you know it's it's as valuable as a video game, if you think about the economics of it and everything else. Does anybody remember who who was that said that? Or, or get, you you probably remember the quote. A lot of people reacted to it uh, when it came out, but. Um, it kind of, it, it kind of, that, that mentality, I think, kind of heads to the answer we go with um, in my second. But let's finish the mail first. It says, I remember being upset when comics went from two ninety nine to three ninety nine across the board and definitely reduced the amount of comics I read as a result. I realize comic readership is stagnant, if not shrinking, but I can't see this as a way to increase readership with current customers and draw in new readers especially when you can get a Shonen Jump and other apps for a couple dollars a month and whole ma- manga collections for 10 Target, by the way, is selling things for $4.99 right now. If, uh, the Tonka Bot version is nuts. Anyway, does the leadership at DC realize they're losing potential readers or they just try to get as much as they can before the bottom drops out? Thanks for all you do with your channel. I started listening a little over a year ago. Pretty much listen every day as a 30-year reader. I appreciate your insights and opinions. I just wish more publishers listened to your advice. So thank you very much. Um, so what's kind of happening here is something you can see in other stores. And if you go into, say, a Target or um, a Walmart or, or you know one of the kind of big box stores, and uh, you you know first of all you go to the toy aisle and and you, you know my kids hang out there and they're looking at various toys and everything else, and you look at how things are priced, be it Legos or action figures or dolls or whatever it happens to be they're looking at. Um, but if you go to a different part of the store, you get kind of what they're calling like collector toys, uh, collector action figures. And they're usually kind of hanging out with Funko, um, you know, collection of garbage there. But these are, uh, toys that are kind of packaged to made to resemble, uh, packaged to resemble the eighties line of toys, a similar box, uh, similar kind of branding. And usually for kind of more adult shows. So they like the, you know, Stranger Things will be there as an action figure line, but packaged like it was in the 80s. Or, you know, they'll they'll take like movie monsters, like I have an action figure of Freddy Krueger or Jason, and uh, they'll they'll be there. Or, you know, here's, here's you know, a, Ripley from Aliens. So now, by and large, if you look at this, a lot of the stuff are either 80s toys or they're nostalgic kind of 80s toys. Um, or made to resemble somewhere along those lines. And the pricing for these things are 15 to $20 a piece. In most cases, they're, they're expensive. You know, if it, the funny part is it's a nostalgic play for everything, but the price, because, you know, I, I remember going down and for a dollar 99, I could buy a star Wars action figure from Kenner or, you know, later, you know, GI Joe or something like that. I mean, transformers is always the the one that got you because it's like they, you know several of those toys are made out of metal and it costs like 10 bucks and it's like oh crap these are these those are the expensive toys 
And, you know, it's, it's, and, and so what's happening there is very similar to what's happening in comics. Basically, there's not a mass audience for Stranger Things action figures or, you know, movie monsters, Freddy Krueger toys. A lot of those figures do not appeal to kind of the current kid generation that are buying toys, but they do appeal to the adults who have grown up and, in theory, have more wealth. They've got disposable income now and they can, they can afford it. It's basically the logic. And so the play, the, the marketing is not, hey, come in, buy this toy, it'll be fun to play with. It's, hey, come in here, remember this thing from your childhood. It would be kind of cool if you, you know, bought this toy, didn't take it out of the box and like put it up in your office and people will go, hey, wow, you, 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 you know, I remember that when I was a kid. It becomes a talking point. You're basically buying decoration. You know, some people fool themselves into thinking you're buying collectability, but, you know, these are nostalgic toys designed to look collectible. They're not terribly collectible. I don't know. Somebody will say otherwise in the comments, like, but I turned it around on eBay for $50. Yes, maybe, but you're selling it to someone else who's even more nostalgic for whatever thing you're selling than you are. It's not as much that it's a collectible. It's that it's appealing to a very narrow audience. In this case, kind of an older audience that wants to kind of remember their childhood and is willing to pay for it. Well, here's the creepy part. That's where comics have largely gone. Comic uh, publishers are, you know, for all the things that are said, by and large, they're not trying to appeal to kids. They're not trying to appeal to the next generation. And I'm being a little extreme here, but they've largely just gone ahead and, and surrendered that to scholastic YA graphic novels and manga. The comics that you get, the comics that we're all familiar with, the comics that many of you come to the channel for, they're all plugging for an older audience. And so that older audience is willing to pay more. So what you're seeing is this entire kind of business and hobby. You're seeing it drift into a more expensive nostalgic play versus a mass market product designed to move lots of units. The choice was made. Do we try and get as many you know, readers as humanly possible? Or do we try and kind of sell to people who remember comics? sell to the, the people who are still collecting them and sell to people who are trying to kind of remember that part of their, their childhood. It's one of the reasons why the variant covers that are the uh, action figure covers are so popular. They're so popular because they're, you know, it's, it's hitting both ends at once. It's trying to appeal to a collector market for the variant. It's also trying to get you to, you know, plug those uh, member berries in your brain to, you know, make you feel good about what happened in the past. And that's the main market. Now, the publishers will say things like, we really need a new audience, and they're 100% right, they do. But they're not putting serious effort into it. When I say serious effort, I mean getting into places outside the direct market where, in theory, they could reach some of these customers, or pricing the content you know, equivalent to manga. I mean, just assume, I know it's fun on YouTube to dunk on these people, but the, you know, the people who are, are running the uh, distribution and the pricing and all that other stuff of Marvel and DC... They're not idiots. They know what they're doing. They know that, you know, pricing something at $4.99 is going to narrow the doorway of new collectors coming into the market. They don't particularly care because they're playing to the one audience they have. They also fully well, they all go to Target, or if they're boycotting Target, Walmart, or wherever, they go, they know that there's manga in there, Tonkaban stuff in there selling for $6.99 or $7.99 or sometimes cheaper. They know it's there. They know this other stuff exists. They're just, they're, they're not, they're, they're not playing in that space right now, nor do I think they really know how to. And so you'll hear like, you know, writers and other things saying, you know, we really need to appeal to the new audience. What they mean by that is we want to appeal to kind of some of the grown up adults that we see at Comic-Con coming in in cosplay who are, you know, super into whole performance art aspect. And if you look at the comics that are being sold and you look at a lot of the storylines that are going on, they're not really written for long-term comic readers. They're written for people who go to the conventions. The, the stories that are kind of inane and, you know, create dress-up opportunities, I mean, hell, the fact that we're getting a real-life Hellfire Gala at San Diego Comic-Con, I mean, the only shock to that is it's coming kind of two years late from when it arguably, you know, they, the, the audience they're appealing to would have gone for it. I'm sure people will show up, but Comics right now, especially for the big two, are appealing to the dress-up crowd at, you know, at, at the cons. They are kind of giving a little bit of, um, 
I don't know, window dressing to the collectors. But there's no market for the kids or the people who are coming in new. And that's what it's going to take to get the comics back down to $199, $299. It could be done. You know, I, I mentioned that earlier, like who, who made that quote? Well, you know, if, if your mentality is, look, we're creating something uh, that, you know, is a craft product that's a bespoke piece of work that's going to appeal to an audience. Well, you're not saying it, but kind of inherent to that is you're creating something for a limited audience. And that's what you're doing. And so in that world, the price can go up, just like the price of uh, nostalgic action figures at Target can be 25 bucks in some cases. People will pay it because, you know, you're not trying to sell it to 100 people. You're just trying to sell it to five. If you could sell it to five, well, then, you know, that, that works. You've figured out a business model in this niche industry to make it work. And by the way, crowdfunding is not terribly helping either because the vast majority of crowdfunded stuff is also being sold at $15, $20 because whether it's, you know, conscious, whether they realize it or not, they're playing to the same strategy. They're playing to a strategy of a very small number of collectors. I, I don't know if uh, Eric July, I, I don't know if he has plans, for example, in his book of, hey, once I get this thing in production, I start churning out more and I get the operations all worked out. I'm going to lower the price because that's all appeal to a wider audience. I don't know. Maybe he, he may have said that. I don't know if that's his play or not. But you would are you might argue, why would he do that? If you're able to raise a bunch of money, if you're able to sell your comics to a specific niche, I'd, niche, that, by the way, or niche, it doesn't mean small. It just means specific. There is a specific audience that you know is willing to pay money for those books because it, it for whatever reason. Now, I don't think July is hitting. Up. But that's, that's in effect what, what's going on. So, you know, it would be wonderful if we could turn back the clock and get comics to the point they're actually growing a new audience, going for new people. It, that would be wonderful. And I hope comics can get there. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to require a massive change of strategy in order to do it. And right now, the strategy that's being played is one that's by and large working for companies. I mentioned in other videos, Marvel and DC are profitable. It's not like they're losing money hand over fist. You know, you, you made the comment, you know, are, you know, are they just uh, trying to get every bit of money out before the bottom drops out? You could make the argument the bottom already dropped out. This is what playing in that limited niche, you know, segment looks like. This is how companies have figured out to still be profitable in that smaller zone. Sure. Anyway, um, that, that, that town turned out to be somewhat depressing. Anyway, <laughs> let me know your thoughts uh, below. Uh, like and subscribe, of course. Uh, or don't. It's okay. It's okay whether you, you subscribe, like, or don't like, or don't subscribe, or never come back in, or come back every day. It's all, it's all up to you, man. Thanks for listening. <laughs>